I think a lot of times when we talk about the real Jesus from the pulpit and in our communities, sometimes we don't know who we are and we don't know where we're going. And we don't know that because we don't study that. And that study begins in the Old Testament. What I'd like to talk about tonight are Christophanies. The appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Because, like Dr. Fernandez said, Jesus Christ was a real, actual person. But we also must acknowledge that Jesus, Jesus was in fact a real and actual God. Amen? And He didn't just begin to exist at His birth. Amen? He existed in infinity. That's really small. I'll read it for you. What is a Christophany? A Christophany is an appearance of non-physical or non-physical manifestation of Christ. So that means something that occurred either pre-incarnation or post-resurrection. Does that make sense? That's a little bigger. Appearance. Appearances are typically seen in the New Testament. Examples include the resurrection accounts, the road to Damascus with Paul, John's vision of the Son of Man in Revelation 1. Those are some of those appearances. Non-physical manifestations. These are the types of manifestations that you will see in the Old Testament. Where Jesus did not have a physical body yet, so he didn't really have a look yet, as we would understand it. But I assure you, he's there. Now, what, I, what, I, what I'm proposing to you tonight, and this is what, and it's real easy to do this when you wrote your thesis on it, um, what I'm proposing to you tonight, that we as Christians have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ existed in the Old Testament, amen? Okay. We also have to admit that there was a resurrection and that people saw him after his resurrection, amen? Amen. What I am proposing to this amazing group tonight is... We can not only recognize Christ by his physical traits, but by the evidences of his personhood in Scripture. And what I mean by that is, if you met me when I was 15, I'm glad you didn't. It was my BC life. We don't talk about that. Um, even though I wasn't a Christian yet, there would still be mannerisms about me and things that I would do or say that might catch your attention. Fast forward to 37. Yes, I'm 37. That usually gets a bigger laugh. Okay. Yes, I'm 37. If you met me today, you might be able to recall me from some of those things that you remembered of me when I was 15. Some of the things that I said that I may still say now. right? But there's a consistency between 15-year-old John and 37-year-old John. Now, some looks have definitely changed, right? Just like Jesus, looks have changed, but it's still the same personhood. So what I'm proposing to you tonight is when you re go home and read your Old Testament, like, well, I don't know if all of you are Bible geeks like I am, but when you do get a chance to look at the Old Testament, look at these Christophanies. Now, I, I, I cite about 27 of them in my paper, we're only going to do three tonight. Thought I'd really get applause for that. Okay. All right. Stay with me, people. Trinitarian doctrine. Now, this is essential to Christian faith. Amen. And also, it is essential to what I'm proposing to you tonight. The truth of the Trinity is based on three presuppositions. Or propositions, I'm sorry. The first, there is only one God. Amen? Amen. There is one God. Maker of heaven and earth. Okay, we won't continue. That one God, there are three personhoods in God called God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Still with me? All right, that's good. Because if you're not, um, you're at the wrong church. I'm sorry. We don't... This is what we preach here. Each of these persons is not the same person. You know what modalism is. The idea that there is one God that shows Himself in three different modes. That is not Trinitarianism. 
We have three persons in one God. And if your brain is exploding right now, that's okay. Because this is a really hard doctrine for the, for the finite mind to understand. We're talking about an infinite God that a finite mind is trying to wrap its head around. So, for example, God the Father is not God the Son, yet both personhoods are in the Godhead. Does that make sense? Are we still, are we still together? All right. The personhood of Jesus Christ. The three persons of the Trinity are distinct in their personification. They do different things. They interact with us differently. Now, they interact with us to look for Christophanies in the Old Testament. We have to understand the personhood of God the Son. So in what ways does He deal with us that differ from the other two personhoods? Now, we could do a, probably a seven-day or a seven-Sunday sem seminar on all three persons, but you're going, to get the, you're going to get the very, very small Cliff Notes version of the person of Christ tonight. The doctrine of the person states this, Jesus must have had these traits. He must be infinite, having no beginning and no, no end. Amen? He must have the ability to create, and he must have the ability to destroy utterly. Because these are the traits of what? God. Jesus, the way He works with us is He reveals God in a very special way to us. And this is something that's very personal in the life of every individual believer. Jesus bears our salvation. Jesus communes with man in this distinct way. And all three personhoods commune in very distinct ways. Now, when we look for Jesus in the Old Testament, we can absolutely find him by these traits, specifically the first one up there. That's not hard to do. But I encourage you to, to remember that this is a personhood. This is not some abstract God. right? This is Jesus Christ who's interested in your Tuesday. Does that make sense? We can see him by his traits. We can see them in the New Testament when he actually speaks two people in the New Testament. And we can actually draw parallels, just like 15-year-old and 37-year-old John, we can draw parallels between Old Testament Scripture and New Testament Scripture. And I will try to show you some examples of that tonight. And if I see you're, you're kind of going sideways with it, we'll break into nothing but the blood, and I'll exit, and it'll be great. <laughs> Remember, it's my church. I'm kidding. It's not my church. It's God's church. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read this for you because there's a lot going on here. Genesis 16, 7 through 13. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face, from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself unto her hand. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said, to her, said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and thou shalt bear a son. And thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Let's break that down. Let's talk about the angel of the Lord for a second. So I was, I was educated at Liberty under an amazing professor, a lot of amazing professors. But I ascribe to this. I ascribe that when we see the term the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament... It is not simply an angel of the Lord. It is the angel of the Lord. There's a specific difference there. Words mean things. Angel means messenger, or more basically, the message or word. Jesus is referred to what in the New Testament? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He has a conversation with the sinner. This is something that we can look at in the New Testament and see that He does regularly. Amen? 
This is something that you can actually look into your own personal life and your personal walk with Jesus Christ and know that He does this. Agree? So based on this divine conversation, I would argue that this is a Christophany. She is actually speaking to the personhood of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Now, let's look for a New Testament reference that might be the same. John 8.10, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? As no one condemned you. She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and thou sin no more. Notice in both interactions, the compassion for the sinner. Why? What had happened with Sarah? What had occurred there? Why are we in this position? Why is she hiding from Sarah? What had occurred? A sin. Amen? Would we agree? Now some would argue, well, Sarah said it was okay. Well, I'm here to tell you, um, humans don't get to pick what's sin and what's not. Okay? We also preach that here. So, um, we don't get to pick and choose what's sin and what's not. Adultery is adultery. Amen? So, isn't it interesting that both interactions show compassion of salvation while not approving of the action? See, what we have here is, this, is the B.C. Jesus and the A.D. Jesus in synthesis in how they speak. This is why I love being a Christian, because I serve a God that is stable, and He does the same thing every time, from everlasting to everlasting. Christophany 2, Numbers 22, 22 through 27. And God's anger was kindled because He went. I love this story, by the way. There's so many ways to go with it. We'd be up here all night, but we'll just we'll stick to the Christophanies. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his mule. I had to change the word there, because we're, we're, we're live. So, and his two servants were with him. And the mule saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword, his sword drawn in his hand. And the mule turned aside out of the way, and went into the field. And Balaam smote the mule to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in path of the, in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the mule saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot. And he smote her again, this poor animal. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the mule saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the mule with the staff. Hmm. There's a couple of things that we can gather from this. So we already know about the angel of the Lord. God's anger is kindled, so the angel of the Lord. Two persons here. God the Father and the angel of the Lord are in this epic. Okay? The Lord, there are two different personhoods. Okay? Okay? The concept of standing in the way of sin is specific to the personhood of Jesus Christ. Amen? How does Jesus stand in the way of sin for us? He died for us. Right? His very resurrection is part of His personhood. It's part of who He is. And what we're seeing here is that same stance in the way of sin. Later in verse 32, the angel of the Lord says to Balaam, I have stood in your way because your way was contrary to me. Interesting that he doesn't say, that the angel, what the angel does not say is you're not contrary to God. This statement assumes divinity of this angel. The angel doesn't say to God, he says to me. But earlier in the verse, it said that whose anger burned for Balaam? God. Notice the air of repentance in the turning away from sin. Notice what Jesus is trying to get Balaam to do. To turn away. We see this same concept play out in multiple Gospel stories. I'm careful to use the word story. Just bear with me. I, they're true stories. I don't like that word. This interaction, I would argue, is with the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Notice that staunch, I'm standing my ground, this is the law, this is what is happening. Notice that air, that attitude in, in numbers. So to me, we can see through the personhood of Jesus Christ, His personality, we can see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Number three, Judges 6, 12-22. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Does that sound familiar to the type of person that Jesus speaks to in the New Testament, in the Gospels? And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Now he gets a sign, and there's a victory from the Midianites. I just couldn't fit the rest of that on there. John 4, the Sumerian woman's conversation with Jesus. Does that ring a bell? with the conversation that we just had? John 20, Doubting Thomas. Once again, we have the angel of the Lord. Gideon is doubting the angel of the Lord. He is not even sure if it really is him. Does that sound familiar? What did Thomas think? Unless what? Unless I see, unless I put my finger through his hands. He's not real. It didn't happen. Just like in John 20, we have a doubting Thomas. Here we have a doubting Gideon. And in the same way, Jesus makes a very real and physical display for Thomas, so does he with Gideon. With Thomas, put your hand in my side. With Gideon, assured victory against the Midianites that does happen, that is recorded in Scripture, and is historically accurate. Jesus is an infinite God. He is part of the Trinity, and he existed long before his incarnation. These we know for sure. We can see these appearances usually under the title, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. What I believe is not only, not only through his might and power and his infinitude, like those, those, those things, those traits of a God, we know. Amen? We know who God is. And we know that God is infinite. And we know Christ is infinite. But we can actually see him as a person in the Old Testament. Why does this matter? Because his interactions with his beloved peoples can be seen and acknowledged in the Old Testament, just like in the New Testament, just like in your life right now. It is the same Jesus Christ from everlasting to everlasting. Why does it matter when we go to defend our faith? Because just like the story of the sailors, a lot of times we don't know where we're going. And we don't, sometimes we don't even know who we are. If we aren't acknowledging the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ as much as we acknowledge the incarnate and the resurrected Jesus Christ, we have a massive fault in our belief. Jesus Christ didn't just start existing when he was born. Amen? He, began, he, never, he didn't begin existing ever. He has always existed. And that's hard for our minds to comprehend. It's hard for humans to understand, and that's why we kind of shy away from the Old Testament Jesus Christ. Because it's, it's the hardest one for the, for the feeble, finite mind to wrap its head around. Because the incarnate Jesus, we can touch with our hands. Right? We put our fingers in his side. The, po the resurrected Jesus, we, we know that in our heart. When you came to the Lord, you, you found that. 
You're with him every day. He walks with me, he talks with me. See, I said if I started to lose you, we start singing songs. Okay? But that pre-incarnate Jesus, it's a little harder for us to look at. So I would encourage you, look at the Old Testament. Find your Savior in the Old Testament. I assure you, He's there. Thank you very much for having me tonight, and thank you for your time.